Hello again. Welcome to our heart to heart chat. Trust you will be blessed and grown so wherever you are. We greet our West Indian friends who have been in touch and have told us that they've listened. Some have complained that they don't hear me very clearly, so I'll speak a little more slowly and deliberately so that everyone can hear my simple message. We're going to read the Word of God, for that is all important. My first reading is from Psalm 49, verse 6. They that trust in their wealth and boast themselves in the multitude of their riches, none of them can by any means redeem his brother, nor give to God a ransom for him. For the redemption of their soul is precious or costly, and it ceaseth forever. Into the New Testament now, and a well-known passage, little portion from Mark and chapter 8, verse 34. And when he, and that is the Lord Jesus, had called the people unto him, with his disciples also, he said unto them, Whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself, and take up his cross, and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. But whosoever shall lose his life for my sake, and the gospels, the same shall save it. For what shall it profit a man? if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? And there is a little text in the book of Joshua in the Old Testament. And it's in the form, not really the form of a question, but it is a statement made that's very important. Choose ye this day whom you will serve. Choose you this day whom you will serve. And God will bless, I'm sure, the readings from his own most precious word. A little time ago, I read in the local newspaper a story about a man who almost lost his life just off the beach at Aberdeen. He was a wind surfer. He was blown off to sea from a, an offshore wind. And he was in danger of his life, of losing his life. The darkness was falling. A rescue mission was launched. A lifeboat, helicopter, and other uh, individuals went out in search for this wind surfer in the darkness of Aberdeen. Finally, the helicopter detected this wind surfer by the latest heat sensitive equipment, otherwise, he would have certainly perished. And they were able to winch him up into the helicopter. And surprisingly, the man, when he was in the safety of the helicopter, turned to the winchman and said, And what about my surfboard? Incredible. The man seemed to be more concerned about his surfboard than his life. For the winchman said to him, what about your life? What about your life? You know, there are quite a lot of people who are more concerned about other things than their own life or their soul. And were I to ask you today, what do you consider to be your most valuable possession? I wonder how you'd answer me. Were I to go out to the streets of Bucky today and Ask a hundred people 
what they consider to be their most precious possession. I'm sure I would get a great variety of answers. Most, of course, would say their family is their most precious possession. Younger people, of course, they would speak about their laptop or other iPad, things that I know so very little about. I'm a computer dunce. In fact, I wouldn't be speaking to you if I didn't get the help of a grandson to set up uh, the iPad. But uh, that would probably be the answer from a young person. Older ones would perhaps speak about their house as being their most valuable possession or a family heirloom. More would, with wisdom would say that you would consider their health to be the most important possession they have. Another with a philosophical outlook would maybe say, well, I think my artistic talent is my most precious possession, able to play some musical instrument, uh, do paint work uh, or whatever. But the Lord tells us clearly in the, his word that our most valuable possession is our soul. He says, For what shall it profit a man if he should gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? There's a little jingle that goes, To lose your uh, wealth is much, to lose your health is more, but to lose your soul is such a loss that nothing can uh, restore. We hear today a lot about the value of property. The houses are rising in prices all the time. We hear of the value of silver, the value of gold, and uh, we hear of the value of stocks and shares. We hear of the value of a good name. Of course, the Bible backs up that claim that the, a good name is better than gold and silver, more valuable than precious stones. We hear of the value of liberty that multitudes have perished for as they've tried to defend it. But what are these? compared to the value of your soul and the value of my soul. For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? We read uh, in the Bible, No man can by any means redeem his brother. Psalm 49 verse 6 to 8 nor give to God a ransom for his soul. The value of the soul is not only precious, but it's costly. No man can by any means redeem his soul, nor give to God a ransom for his soul. The redemption of the soul is costly. Yes, we have a priceless possession, our soul. We must beware, of course, because outside of Christ, we are in a perilous position. We are in danger of losing our priceless possession. We are in a perilous position, out of Christ without a saviour. Oh, can it, can it be like a ship without a rudder on a wild and stormy sea? Can I ask you, are you drifting towards eternity shore where the wrath of God shall fall upon your unprotected head? Now, I'm not trying to be over dramatic, but this is a fact. For God hath appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man 
that is Christ Jesus, whom he hath ordained. Now, we can understand that we're all different. You're different from me, I'm different from you. But in this respect, we are exactly the same. We are all on a journey, the journey of life. And death is a great junction where we all must change for either the great eternal terminus heaven or the great eternal terminus hell. I wonder, dear friend, dear listening friend, whither bound, where are you going to spend eternity? The person who dies unsaved is lost forever. And if we can recall a past message speaking about the must and matters move, you must be born again. If you're not born twice, far better had you not been born once. Far better had you never been born at all. If, as some say, there is no God, some are cynical, they say that it's all in the imagination. If there is no heaven and no hell, if there is no devil, if there is no sin to be accounted for, then nothing matters. Nothing at all matters. Let us live a life of ease and, and pleasure in any way we like. But, dear fr listening friend, if these things are true, if there is a God to face, if there is a heaven and hell, if there is sin, then nothing else matters. That's the most important thing. No one in the right mind, I'm sure, today, would deny the reality of sin. We have all been shocked this week by reading of that poor lady on her way home being arrested by a policeman and brutally murdered Rachel Everard by this terrible man. Sin is a reality. It's getting worse and worse. We are supposed to be improving by education and so on. This world is not getting any better. You're not safe to walk down the street and be protected by those who are paid to protect you. Yes, sin is a reality. Sin breaks hearts, breaks homes and fractures families, and I, I can testify to that personally. Sin digs graves. Sin builds hum crematoriums. Sin insults God and populates hell. Sin has given Satan his power. Sin has given death its terrors. Sin has given eternity its dread. Little wonder the Lord asks this question. For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Now the word exchange it has the idea of choice. You exchange something for something else, but you have to make a choice. Now, we all have to make important choices. When we go to school and leave for university or whatever, we have to make choice of subjects to study. We have to make the choice of a career. We have to make a choice regarding a partner in life. We have to, to make a choice of a place where to live. And if you live as long as I have lived, then perhaps you have to make a choice as to which care home you have to go to. Yes, the idea of, 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 of choice is, carries consequences. Now, Adam made a, a choice. He chose to disobey God. And choices have consequences and all have been affected as a consequence of his sin. As by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, 
So death is passed upon all men, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Esau in the Old Testament, he made a choice, a very foolish choice. He sold his birthright, he bartered his birthright for a, a, a bowl of soup, a mess of pottage. It's really just a, a bowl of soup. He lo lost his inheritance, his birthright. Achan was another Old Testament character. As the nation of Israel attacked Jericho, now they had been instructed not to take anything, any silver or gold or whatever. That had to be placed into the treasury of God. But this man saw a wedge of gold and silver and goodly garments. And he took them and hid them in his tent. Nobody saw it, but God saw it. And the nation of Israel suffered as a consequence. And his family suffered as a consequence. And they were put to death. Can I ask you today, would you rather have money, power, fame, or would you rather have Christ choose you this day? whom you will serve. Are you prepared to forfeit eternal joy in the Father's house for some passing, paltry, glittering prize that, in which your heart is presently set? What shall a man give in exchange for his soul? You have a priceless possession. But if you're outside of Christ, you're in a perilous position. Burton said, pleasures are like poppy spread. You see the flower, the bloom is shed. Or like a snowflake on the river, a moment white, then gone forever. Judas made a solemn choice. Thirty pieces of silver. He was prepared to betray his Lord for that paltry sum. And he went to his own place. The Bible says he went to his own place. The eternal blackness of darkness forever. That was the consequences. And in the day when the Lord was days when the Lord was here, he was in the presence of Pilate. It was a time of a feast. And at that feast, they were allowed to release a prisoner, to appease the people, to keep them happy. Pilate thought that he would be able to release Jesus when he had been arrested. But when he asked the people, what will I do with Jesus, whom you call Christ? The answer, give us Barabbas. Who is this Barabbas? A murderer, a robber. Give us Barabbas. Crucify Christ. They made an important choice. There was a rich young ruler who made a, a choice. He wanted eternal life. And he says, what must I do to inherit? The Lord told him what to do. Men giving away his money. In his case, not. That doesn't apply to every individual. But it applied to him. His heart was set on riches. The Lord told him what to do with the riches, and he went away sorrowful, for he had many riches. I wonder, dear friend, can you truly say the words of that hymn that Jim Reeves sings and uh, Billy Graham singer, I forget his name uh, at the moment, or rather George Beverly Shea, sorry, I'd rather have Jesus than silver or gold. I'd rather have Jesus than riches and toil. I'd rather have Jesus than houses and lands. I'd rather be led by his nail pierced hands. Had to be the king of a vast domain or be held in sin dread sway. I'd rather have Jesus than anything this world affords. Today, for what shall it profit a man if he should gain the whole world and lose his own 
soon. You know, Moses made an important but a very wise choice. We read of him that when he was come to years, he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin. And we read that he turned his back and the pleasures of Egypt. When it was come to years, yes, he made this choice. He would rather have his links with God, links with spiritual things, the future and heavenly glory, than to enjoy the pleasures of sins for a mere passing season. You know, only God knows the true value of your soul. Only the Lord Jesus can redeem your soul. And we are not redeemed with corruptible things, silver and gold, from your vain conversation, received by tradition from your Father, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb, without blemish and without soul. It was costly for him to redeem you. He knows the value of your soul and was prepared to pay the price of the sufferings of Calvary. The abandonment of God. See, with crying those hours of darkness, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Such value he put on your soul, who for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. What was the joy set before? The joy of redeeming your soul. That's how much value he put on your soul. A priceless position, a perilous position, but a promised pardon. Come now, the Lord says, Isaiah 1, 4, 18 and 18 days. Come now and let us reason together. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red as crimson, they shall be as wool. He has provided a great salvation and he has promised to pardon you. It was great because of the person who preached it. Who was the Lord Jesus? None other but God over all, blessed forever. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God and the Word was God. The Word was made flesh, dwelt among us. That's the Lord Jesus. He is God, ever shall be. Jehovah, the Eternal One. He was great because of the cost involved, the sufferings of Calvary, bearing shame and scoffing rude. In my place, in your place, if you trust him, condemned he stood, sealed or pardoned with his blood. Hallelujah. What? A saviour. He left the glory of heaven, knowing his destiny was a lonely hill of Golgotha, there to lay down his life for me. Can you really feel in your heart say that? He had to make a choice. The Lord Jesus had to make a choice. He didn't need to go to Calvary. In fact, when he was alive on earth, he, had, he could have left at any time. Of course, he had no sin, sinless, spotless, and pure, and the wages of sin is death, so death had no claim upon him. He could have returned, surrounded by a claiming, an acclamation of angels, and taken his seat by his father's side, but he made a choice. He said, Father, not my will, but thine be done. He came on the greatest rescue mission of all time. Yes, there was a rescue mission for Stuart Cameron. He didn't appreciate what they had done for him. But this was the greatest rescue mission of all time. He could say, I'm come that he might have life and have it more abundantly. I'm come to seek and to save. The Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost the greatest rescue mission of all time 
Jesus alone can give life. Life with a capital L. You know, Solomon, with all his wealth, he had all the wealth and opportunity to enjoy the life's pleasures. And he describes life. He says, it's all vanity and vexation of spirit. Lord Byron, he said, my life at the end of a, a wasted life. He could say, my life is in the yellow leaf. The flowers, the fruit of life are gone. The worm, the canker, and the grief are mine alone. We hear a lot today about the quality of life. People are living longer, but it doesn't always bring quality of life. That is sometimes lost. So, quality of life. The Lord Jesus offered eternal life. Quality, nothing can compare with us. The gift of God is eternal life. And it's a life of quality, more abundant. I wonder, will you receive the Lord Jesus as your saviour? Will you receive the gift of eternal life? Only you can make this choice. I appeal to you today. Choose you this day whom you will serve. The Lord bless you and keep you. And thank you once again for listening.